the IEA, you know, in 2015, undertook a study to promote inclusiveness, reduce poverty, and promote sustainable economic development in Ghana. And based on the background study we undertook, we realized that although women constitute over 51% of our society, they were the most marginalized in economic development in Ghana. Work is second nature to Ghanaian women. Wherever they are, they've learned since their childhood days as girl children, young and adult women, there are specific activities that are assigned to them as women's work. From the household, the community, the wider economy, the Ghanaian woman's work is never done. The work women do, particularly in northern Ghana, cannot be overemphasized. They can be found in all sectors of the economy. In the informal sector, they act as farmers, traders or homemakers. In the formal sector, as teachers, nurses or office executives. As a culture and as a way that we are brought up, generally women are more of caregivers. Be at home and take care of the family needs in terms of feeding, in terms of sanitation, in terms of those who are sick and the elderly. So that, is, that takes a very chunk part of what women are supposed to be doing. Every home or every economy, women are usually the spine because almost every sector you go, you find women there. Especially the informal sector, they are the majority. Think of farming, weaving, tailoring, and they are mostly the breadwinners of the families. We use the money to help our children in school. That's one important. We use it to buy ingredients to help our husbands for cooking and other household petty petty things we can use it to help. To be very honest with you, the women does almost everything in the family. Apart from feeding the children, the women take care of the children, even in education. And yet, you can say that the work that women do in these areas have not been so valued. We call them housewives. That's the, the main role of women in this area. Most of the women are not educated, so they don't have employable skills whereby they can seek government employment. A lot of them are into business ventures. Despite the important role of women as economic actors in the northern part of Ghana, they remain among the poorest in the country. We settled on the three northern regions because those regions are amongst the regions that are most, the most deprived and underdeveloped. And women there were faced with a number of barriers, serious constraints that impeded their participation in economic activity. Women are marginalized and their potential is inhibited by several socio-cultural and economic factors. These factors can be linked to certain cultural practices prevalent in the northern regions of Ghana. Some of the cultural rights are widowhood rights, female genital mutilation, and these things are also affect them economically. For example, if you happen to, to lose a husband and you have some economic activity, it means it can take you more than one year before you can go back to that your economic activity because you might have been playing some cultural rice in the funeral house, either as a widow or helping the family to tarry certain things because of the funeral. During my pitot bearing days, I had lots of customers, but after my husband died and I went through the rituals for almost a year, I realized I had lost most of my customers because of the perception people generated about me. So I lost courage and stopped the business. If you were, let's say, a businesswoman, after the death of your husband, and you are indoors for six months, what do you think your business will do? You see that all the family, the husband is gone, and the family cannot continue living. Because of the female genital mutilation, it was quite difficult for me to give birth. Some of my friends couldn't even give birth because the baby died in the process of coming out. So they were branded as witches because people perceived that they were eating up their own children. So nobody bought anything from them or did business with them. But I was very lucky to have given birth. Some women are accused of witchcraft and are sometimes brutalized and beaten. They usually flee to witch camps in order to avoid being lynched. Such camps can be found in Bunyasi, Gambaga, 
Nyani, Patinga, Kukuo, and Naboli, all in northern Ghana. Back home in my community, when someone was sick, they pointed fingers at me as the cause. This happened severally, so I decided to leave. Before then, I was farming, brewing pito, and selling millets. Many times, I doubled or tripled the profits. People really appreciated my business. But now, everything has just fallen apart, just because some people got up and labeled me as a witch. Things are very difficult now. How many people won't tag you as a witch even if you decide to do some business? Those who believe me make it better. But how many people can I convince that I'm not a witch? It means that everything that I'll do will fail. So life is really a struggle now. I'm just waiting for the day I will die and that will be all. Immediately that woman is banished away from your community. The little that she was eating, the little that she was depending, everything is destroyed. So you come here and start afresh. And even coming here is a difficult thing. Because you have left your family, you are now in a new place. Thinking about the, the thing they have tacked, the tack on you. A witch. How do you even sleep? Early and forced marriages also hinder the economic prospects of women in the northern part of Ghana. The prevalence rates of early and forced marriages in Ghana showed that the Upper East region had the highest of 50% followed by the Upper West with 39% and Northern with 36%. I was 16 years when I got married off, so I could not complete school. I don't have any work to help me take care of myself and my family. If a man is there in a family, and he cannot take care of the house. He thinks that the daughter should go and marry. For he, the man, to make money. And you know something, one funny thing about us here is that when your daughter goes to marry, you are being paid four cows. That is a tradition. So people use that as an advantage to enrich themselves and they are gone. Once the lady becomes pregnant and she has been forced to stay with the boy, meaning they are going to encounter total poverty. And once you are poor, you can't undertake any economic activity. Even if it is selling, you need money to start the business. It affects economical growth because people will not go to school. If your daughter is up to 12 years, 18 years, and you think she's so advanced in school and she's given out for marriage, how does that help? It is abominable for a man to be seen performing household chores or helping his wife to perform some household duties considered as women's work. They don't support women, that's why. But we do complain to them. But they say we should do it. It's our work. <laughs> well, that is, well, I mean, our traditional setup. Generally, a man is not supposed to be doing the perceived work of, of women, like cooking or, or washing of children or even washing dishes, dish, dishes in the in the house. It, it's it's an of, an unheard of for a man to do that. If you are found doing women activities, they look at you as a woman man or somebody who has no work to do. Because when men are outside doing things, then you will be found in the house helping your wife to do things. That's why they say if you cannot have one wife, they marry two wives to enable the women to do lesser work in the house. I went to get firewood for my wife to cook and fell down from the tree in an attempt. The villagers said I was following my wife like a dog and so I deserved it. Because of that, they refused to help me. They are always laughing at me. It's ignorance. And just what I said about the culture, the religion and the socialization. Some people right from day one, they don't know that a woman is important. And even, I'm telling you, referring you back to the classroom, there were some boys that could not even come nearer to us in terms of academic. But in the community, they, they don't see your importance. In certain cultures, it is generally unacceptable for women to be leaders. Women who put themselves up for leadership positions are perceived to be disrespectful. Men, they don't agree women to be leaders. So from that place, they don't suppose the women to go higher so that they will challenge them with the leader side. That's another problem. They don't take decisions with you as a woman. If there's a problem in the house, whether even the clan or even the community, the men will sit down and decide what to do. I just have to tell you that this is what will be done. Because you are a woman, they feel you are not their colleague. Therefore, they don't see why a woman should be their leader. They're not supposed to play active politics because their husband will not allow them. Because they don't want them to be heard speaking 
in public. But if they speak in public, they, are, they will perceive them as talkatives, as witches, as somebody who don't respect their husband at home. A woman is not supposed to be a driver. We haven't seen it before. Unless it's of course in Accra or big cities, but in this community, if a woman is driving a car, there are a lot of perceptions going by, you know, so, so, something of that sort. Women are not allowed to own land. The patriarchal nature of these societies prohibits women from inheriting land and other property. We, the women here, we don't own lands simply because we practice the patrilineal system of inheritance. The woman leaves her family to settle with the man's family, so she's a stranger in the man's family and cannot own land. And you can't transport land from your father's house to your husband's house, so you have to rely on your husband to get a portion of land to farm on. The land we are farming on belongs to the elders of the community. We have to go and solicit for a piece of land to enable us to farm. They do not give a large piece of land to one person because we are many. Ladies do not own land. You have to go and plead. Either you may even be giving or not. Even let's even assume that you have been giving. Can you afford the money for the tractor to plow the land? If you can't afford, you can't afford fertilizer, neither can you afford sowing and the weeding. So it's a problem. A woman cannot just get up and go and buy a piece of land to farm. Your man has to take the lead to look for the land for you because you are his property. Access to credit is another inhibiting factor. Because they're poor, they have no collateral to enable them secure enough capital for their businesses. If you are going to collect a loan, they ask you whether you have got a, a, a goat or sheep or a teller or you have got a, a store and we, we don't have any store, we don't have any teller, we don't have any sheep or goat. If you will, they will say you should bring house uh, uh, papers or plot papers or you should bring your business certificate or what business you do. They will ask you more of this before they give you the loan. But the interest rate too is high. Yes, in this part of our country, that's Upper West region, uh, it's really not be easy for women to get access to credit because of the guarantee they have to provide. And then many of the women we have here, very few of them own properties, very few of them are able to purchase certain landed properties. So when it comes to providing collateral for low income, becomes difficult for the woman. And because of the, the control of the husband, they are not supposed to be in groups. Sometimes if they are in groups, they can't assess loans. Sometimes if they are assessing loans, the husband must give approval. And this will affect them economically. Even though you, you as a lady are going to pay for that money, but if your husband is not agree, that thing can net misunderstand between you and your husband. And uh, the farming side, we don't get manure, fertilizer, to fertilize our things. We don't get the farming means to farm our farms very early. So it makes us not to get the food to feed our families. And also we don't get money to trade what we want to trade. Sometimes they bring this thing known as coupon, which is subsidizing the fertilizer. So we have to acquire the coupons before we are able to get access to the fertilizer at a low cost. But getting the coupons too is not an easy thing. Before you get the coupon, you might have known somebody either in a political position or somebody that is really close to you. Government policies have also generally failed to address the many barriers women face as economic actors. There are quite a number of policies, but the question is, are they being implemented as they are supposed to? Generally, sometimes when you look at our policy systems, what they have in Ghana, it's like we are forcing to pretend that we are not in a very gendered society. We are pretending that the grounds are laid, everyone has access opportunity. But the truth is that people have different access based on their situation and also based on the gender issues. So our policies generally are very gender blind. They don't recognize the differences between women and men, especially when it comes to economic activity. One policy is about the mass lock. We there are small scale loans that government has instituted. 
this loan scheme or microcredit scheme is being designed to boost women's economic activities. But if you look at how that project is being administered, it doesn't actually favor uh, most women. And the reason is that they don't actually come at the time that the women will be needing this kind of facility. And also it doesn't affect many women, just some few. They want women to be in groups, a group of 50, a group of 25, and they give tokens. If a group of 25 or 50 is giving 5,000 Ghana cities, how might are they able to share among themselves so that it can boost them uh, economically? So as a formal sector worker, you have three months when you deliver to go home and then take care of your child. My situation, for instance, as a teacher, you can't send your child to school after that three months. You are either supposed to get somebody a distance away from where your school is. When it's break time, you go and breastfeed this child and come back. But the child is just three months. The immune system is not so strong as to withstand any disease. The child has to breastfeed exclusively for six months. And you are not expected to carry this child into your classroom. Once the director of education or any officer comes and then meets you with this child in the class, you would have an issue. If you also look at the National Health Insurance Scheme, women are paying premium as equal as the men. And as a result of their low income status, they are not able to access it as compared to men. Clearly, for these women, their continued ability to confront economic hardships is itself a pointer to their sense of accomplishment as critical economic actors. If economic policies provide more and better incomes for women, that would be a major entry point for enhancing their voices and amplifying their contributions as economic actors. Like some other great figure in Ghana was